Well, it would be pretty helpful to understand this portion of your word. Some of us have known it from Sunday school. It's a crack in the arm. It's a fearful story. And we just pray that you'll help us to learn from it those things that you'd have us take into our coming week and into the rest of our lives. Please help us and set us free from our preconceptions, our ideas, our loves and our hates, that we might hear from you as you speak in your word. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Samson, the folly of a middle-aged man. Samson has been 20 years judge of Israel. He's been living in the cave at Etam for some long time. He's a middle-aged guy. And the encounters of chapters 14 and 15 of Judges, they're now a little way in the past. And Samson has lived in his seclusion at Etam, alone in his cave, visited, of course, for the judgment of disputes and the services that he would offer as an ancient tribal leader, but living apart from his people for fear of bringing down upon them the wrath of the Philistines. Remember, the people of Dan have no walled cities. They live in tents. They're the peasants amongst the tribes of Israel. They've got no defensive structures. And Samson has been performing this role of stirring up the Philistines so that the people who have acquiesced in Philistine overlordship realise the wrong of it. And that the quiet conquest of Israel that's gone on bit by bit, Philistine ideas and society and culture and religion seeping in quietly, a line has been drawn in the sand by Samson's activity. And as he lives up there in this cave, away from his people for their protection, largely worked apart from affairs like the showdown of Jawbone Hill, remember that? The policy seems to be working apart from that. There are puzzled looking faces because they weren't here for the show born, showdown at Jawbone Hill. Uh, you'll have to go find it on, the, on uh, YouTube. There you go. What we know pretty well about Samson, though, in all of that, marvellous, outstanding leader. I mean, tremendous exploits done in the name of God. Tremendous service performed for the people by pointing out how far they've slipped without noticing into godlessness. What we know about him, all that being the case, was that he was still definitely a bit of a boy for the girls. Now you might want to say that could be worse, but actually it's his downfall. He had a clear tendency towards falling in lust with unsuitable women. And by middle age, that tendency has become the habit of his life, and it's about to become his undoing. It is scary, God. The relationships we form very much determine the people we're able to be in our devotion to, in our service of the living God. And Samson has got this thing left there, stuck in his life, that he hasn't dealt with. And so Samson, even in middle age now, he doesn't always do his thinking with his head. And now he's approaching lonely middle age. And it's not getting easier. It's not getting better. Ladies, you might have noticed, something really odd can happen to men's thinking as they approach middle age. Good men. And Samson wasn't completely a good man. He's a flawed hero. His gifts and this worldly preeminence that he's got have been deployed previously to cover the cost of his sinful behaviour. The sins of the gifted and the talented can run further, can run faster, because the gifts and their talents give them legs to run further and faster than the rest of us from the consequences of their sin and to cover it. That's what Samson has done. I could cite politicians, I could cite the powerful in the government, the state, the church. Such influence and leadership as you have can get you deeper in the mud because of your increased ability, because of your gifting, your talent, your power, to drag yourself on through the stuff. So you can understand why, as James writes in the third chapter of his epistle to Jewish believers, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. When we're in positions like that, we'll be judged more strictly. So here's Samson, the middle-aged man, falling for one after another unsuitable woman. And there's something pathetic about it. Because here's this immensely strong man who's not strong enough to say no to himself. 
He can say no to a thousand Philistines at a time. But he cannot say no to himself. And that's his tragedy. And that's the tragedy of the people of God that he's serving in his day. Because he embodies their errors. They can't say no to Philistinism. He embodies their errors in himself. She said, well, that later on. Okay, he starts off this chapter when he sees one of these women in Gaza. There's a map. Do you like a map? I get the impression you like a map. Here are the five cities of the Philistines. They're these big red ringy dots. Donuts. Red donuts. So they are. One, two, three, four, five. There, that's the Pentapolis. That is the five Philistine cities that form this coalition. And there's the edge of their influence running down the map. You can see it roughly there. Samson goes down from about here. We'll have a map later on that shows us roughly where. He goes down to Gaza. Samson goes down to Gaza. Southernmost, the big five Philistine cities. The one right up against the borders of Egypt. A long way, maybe 38 miles from Samson's origins up at Zorah and his refuge in the rock in the cave of Etan. It was Philistine heartland, the seat of power of the empire of evil. And here's the man responsible for pointing out the errors of Philistia that the rest of Israel weren't getting. And what's he doing? He's taking himself down to Gaza. Why? What were you doing there? How many times when a guy's got himself in trouble has that been the first question? What on earth do you think you were doing there? What was Samson ever doing going down there? We left him, lonely, heroic figure, following that lonely lifestyle as a judge in Israel, choosing to live apart from his people and there with the sacrifice of that for their safety in the cave in the rock at Etam. He's set apart, distinctive, heroic figure, stuck up there, ruling and judging for Israel, sacrificing his own aspirations to relationship, maybe to family, for the sake of God and for the sake of God's people. So what is he doing at God? All sorts of guesses get made in the commentaries. But they're guesses. This is a risky place for him to go. I mean, at all sorts of levels, it's a risky place for him to go. But hard, hard to believe that none of the Philistines living at Gaza would realise this is Samson, the scourge of the Philistines. Let's do him in! In fact, he gets recognised at the start of verse 2. Maybe he just walked in there like the lawman in the cowboy towns in the westerns, you know? Every eye fixed on his back as he strides down the gunman's sidewalk, you know? Down the middle of the street. No one brave enough to challenge this phenomenal, awe-inspiring individual. Maybe. We don't know. Who knows? He could surely have had very little business being where he was, and he certainly wasn't going to be spreading peace and love by his being there. And verse 1 tells us, with the least compunction possible, what it is that he goes there for. What did he get up to? He saw a prostitute there, so he went in to spend the night with her there. The Bible has got absolutely no hesitation exposing the flaws of its heroes. Have you noticed that? The contemporary church covers up the faults of its heroes. The Bible brings sinful conduct to light. It is God who is perfect, not his people. That's what the Bible teaches. If there were no Jesus Christ, no cross on Calvary, no cry of dereliction and no resurrection, no grace of God for sinners, coming in hundreds of years to come, that it simply couldn't have been so that the Bible would expose the sins of people like this. But the whole point is that God is in the business of dealing with sinners. And saving them by his own blood. Shed on the cross. And therefore he also graciously uses the most sinful of people to our eyes to serve his purposes. And there'd be none of us of any use to him if he didn't. So when you get commentators queuing up to criticise Simpson and tut-tut about his behaviour, mm -hmm. 
Think of to know him. Now, of course, that's no excuse for Samson and what he does. We are still, every one of us, depending on that mercy, still fully responsible for our waywardness and sin. And Samson shows off plenty of waywardness and sin here. What does he do? He goes down to Gaza where he shouldn't have gone, and in that seaside town, funny enough, he finds himself a prostitute, just like that. Just as Israel herself has developed a lust for things Philistine, Samson also identifies with their error. In fact, he has a bit of a record for identifying with their error, for showing a strong taste for things Philistine, particularly for Philistine women. The forbidden fruit appears to be the sweetest. First there was the woman in Timnah, which led to shed loads of trouble way back when. Foxes, tails tied together, corn. Yeah? And then, um, <clears throat> who was it? 30 garments, wasn't it? 30 sets of garments. Now there's this prostitute in Gaza. Later there's going to be Delilah. Semitic name, but the details of the narrative certainly seem to suggest she's a Philistine woman. And he goes to this place, and he gets entangled in this mess, and then he gets rumbled. Philistines! Think! Whoa! Samson's here! We love him! And they lay in wait for him. But he wakes up in the middle of the night, He surprises them all by breaking out of the city in the middle of the night. You can see the doors would all be locked in the city. That's the way it went. The doors are open in the daytime. People can come and go. Then there's kind of curfew. Doors are all bolted, locked. Guards there. Do, 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 do. Up gets Samson. Takes the doors. Takes the door posts. Takes the bar securing the doors which shut, which, to prevent its removal by battering rams during siege warfare, was let into the stone door posts on each side. Picks it all up. Takes it with him. Got to bear in mind the whole thing is metal clad to fireproof the doors against incendiary attack during warfare. The picture on the slide, which you can see there, I'm sure you can see it even though the light is bad, is of a reconstruction in the British Museum of the Balawat city gates from ancient Assyria. We saw that not so long ago. They were commissioned by a an Assyrian king, but they're from the period. The doors were four metres high. They all consisted of 16 bronze bands, eight each side, around the doors, and the bronze, bronze bands were arranged in this decorative way, and then the gates were decorated with all sorts of embossed things stuck through the doors and whatever. Don't have any archaeology for the gates of Gaza, probably because it was a frontier town. It was right up against the desert. It took a lot of incoming warfare from wandering desert bands. So Samson gets up in the prostitute's house in the middle of the night, creates night terrors for generations of Philistines because he finds the city gates closed, picks the gates up, lifts them away, carries them off into the distance, still carrying them. There you go. See you boys. The Israelites have just taken Philistine supremacy for granted and are living like slaves because of that. And Samson is giving the light of did you notice what Samson does with the gates that he removes that night? <coughs> this great symbol of Philistine strength, the city gates, the strongest part of their defense, you know, that stuff. <coughs> Verse 3, he got up, took hold of the gate, doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. The nearest hill facing Hebron is 38 miles away, and the road is pretty much uphill all the way. Quite a stunt, isn't it? That's quite a lift and shift. And Hebron is Israel's highest city above sea level. So the hill would have been one of the highest points in Israel. So the gate of their enemy's royal city is sitting on top of a hill for all the Israelites from miles around to see. What an insult, what an embarrassment to the Philistines. Some of their city gates have been breached. It's that they've been lifted, picked up, shifted uphill 38 miles and stuck on the highest hill in Israel so everybody can see how pathetic they are. Enjoying that bit, Caleb? <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> Israel's spiritual dalliance with Philistine culture and religion, so highlighted by Samson. And God's power to overcome it so very clearly demonstrated. 
But now the scene moves again. It now moves again from Gaza to the valley of Sorek, just below Zora, where Samson is coming from, basically. There's another map for you I will look at. When he went to Delilah, another dodgy woman, Samson was back at the heart of his clanman's own territory. And there are dodgy people there. In amongst them. More than dotted around. As we've said, Delilah was a Semitic name. She seems to have been at least part Philistine by birth, thoroughly Philistine by disposition. And Samson is fatally attracted to the woman. And he can't say no to himself. Strange that Samson's three loves should have been numbered amongst his most inveterate enemies, those Philistines. No restraint at all in his actions. He is following his animal instinct. And there's an area of his life that is not under the authority of God. And it's become something of a habit with him to be out of control in that area of his life. He does not get any better with age. Don't go down that track of thinking that. It does not get any better with age. It gets better with repentance and faith. The problem seems to intensify for him as he gets closer and closer, enters middle age. Well, you know the story. You know the story very well. The Philistines come along to Delilah. They think she's got an in with him. Let's get to her. Philistines come along, they say, there's 1,100 shekels of silver. It is a huge amount of money, each of us. So we're talking now 5,500 shekels of silver. She won't be able to pick that up and carry it to Morrison's. Okay? It's a lot of money. Find out the secret of his strength. Delilah makes this treacherous request. Samson? Tell me the secret of your strength. You're not telling me something. You're not telling me something, dear. And she keeps on. It becomes a repeated request because trickery infects their relationship. Well, if you do this, I'll lose all my strength. No, you don't. If you do this, I'll lose all... He's just giving her an answer to shut the woman up. There's a mistake to it. What a mistake to me. Trickery infects that relationship. And on and on it goes. Can you imagine him? So he gets up in the morning, shakes his head, and there's a moving, a, a weaving loom all in his hair. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, I bet he was best pleased about that. And he's just wandering around cleaning his teeth and he's got a loom behind him. Bonkers. But then she plays her ace card. If you really love me, you tell me. Don't ever go there. Don't ever go to if you really love me, because, do you know, there's a reason you're not being told. Maybe. If you really love me, you tell me the truth, because you're making me look a bit daft. And because she kept on and on, Samson told her. This big, huge, strong guy gives in to this whining woman because he loves her and it's infected their relationship and he tells her. She shaves his head, he wakes up. Philistines are upon you and they are. He didn't know the Lord. So the important issues here are not actually the relationship with Delilah. Mm. The important issue here is the relationship with God. And this woman is influenced in a way from that. We have tremendous influence on the ones we love, don't we? And he's muppet enough to have fallen for this one. Here is pretty much the point of this first part of this, this first part of the chapter. He didn't even know the Lord had left him. What sort of tragedy is that? He still thinks he's big and strong and powerful. This is going to be great, it's fine, you know. He didn't know God had left him. 
He got used to God stepping into the situation and bailing it out and making it right. But actually God has left him. This is a scary description of how backsliding works. He knew what he got into with Delilah. He knew he shouldn't have. He knew how she'd been bent on dragging out his secret. Why didn't he run a mile when he saw that happen? He knew that he'd finally given in and told her the whole story. He still laid down that night and went to sleep. He knew she'd already fetched fresh thongs, woven his hair in the loom, and so on and so on. He knew not only what he'd told her, but exactly how she'd used the information that Samson, in his infatuation, had given her before. But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. That's how it goes. And here's the church in Wales today responding to threats to the faith through campaigning and politics. Politics is no help. Because her locks lie in heaps on the floor. I suggest, fearfully suggest, it is a futile business trying to rouse yourself just as the Philistines are attacking when your locks already lie in heaps on the floor. We desperately lack the power of God. We desperately lack the power of God. He didn't know that the Lord had left him. And all up and down this land of Wales, it is all too easy for us, the evangelicals, to find ourselves exposed in exactly that very same position. All too easy to acquiesce in the right formulations of truths of your own. Or the right associations and allegiances. Without cultivating the conscious presence of God and your walk with Him and living each day not in your strength and ability but only by His grace. He didn't know that the Lord had left him. So they captured Samson. And God let him. And they gouged out his eyes so that he was no longer a threat to them. And God let them. And those Philistines intended not that he should be killed by them, that would have been easy, become a martyr for his cause, but that he should live on as their plaything, a living illustration of the power of the Philistines and the danger of messing with them. And God let them. And they taunted him, and they dissed his God, and God let them. Samson began to treat all that God had given him as if it was his. And he could act as he wished because he had this great gift, ability. Look where he came to. Blind and bound in Gaza. And God let them do it. And we see him next on show being taunted in the temple of David. And he didn't know the Lord had left him. And that's how he ended up there. Next time. We'll have him in the temple, shall we? You're going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stop now. <laughs>